You sloppy git. Git is one of the most popular version control systems available for developers. And there are many tutorials online that will show you how to use its features via the command line or an interface. But what they don't really do is give you a big picture overview of how to implement Git into a project in a way that makes sense and makes it easy for you to actually go back in your code and find what you're looking for. So that's the issue I'm going to address today. Now there are almost certainly many ways to implement Git into any given project. And what you're going to want to do is to take into account the different features of Git and the needs of your project. So what I'm going to show you today is one example of how to do that. And the takeaway from this should not be that this is the best way or the only way to do it. Rather, I want you to leave this video feeling like you should think about this before you begin a project. You should go into a project with a plan of how you are going to implement Git in a way that makes sense for your project. And if you have a different method that you like to use, I would love to hear about it. So you can leave that in the comments below and you can help me learn as well. So with that, let's jump into the actual usage of Git. Let's first talk about repositories. Now a repository you can think of as code over time. That is changes that happen in code as you work on it. And it's a log of your edits over time. And the base unit of this repository is going to be called a branch. Usually the first branch you create in any Git repository is the main or master branch. And this is going to hold your latest stable release of your code. So only once your code has reached a point where you're ready to share it, will you put it in this master branch. Off of this branch, you will have additional branches creating a tree structure. And these will be individual features that you're working on for your code. Now what's particularly nice about Git is that you can have branches off of branches and these can be experiments with different features. You can even abandon these experiments later without affecting the main version of your code. It will save all of these different versions concurrently. So at any stage, you can go back to what you already had. And this whole collection of branches is referred to as the repository. So a Git repository is a collection of branches and different commits to those branches that contain all of your code over time. So now we want to consider where we're actually going to put this entire repository. Of course, the easiest thing to do is to put it right on the machine you're working on, but that's often not the most practical. Usually you're going to be working with what are called remote repositories. That is a repository that is stored on a different computer or a server, and you're going to be working in a client server relationship. So the client will download the code, either all of it or in part, from the server, make any changes, and then push those changes back to the server to be saved. And what's particularly nice about this is that many different people can be working on the code at the same time. So this allows big teams to work together in an organized fashion on code projects. Now the most popular version of a remote repository is the website GitHub where you can put all of your Git repositories and store them either publicly or privately, but you will end up putting your code on someone else's server in order to do this. And I personally like to keep all of my things to myself. So I have over to my left here, a data center that I have been working on that I have my own remote repositories stored. I will put some on GitHub, but all of them will go over onto those servers as well. That way I keep a copy in my own personal architecture of all of my code. And I organize this by having just one directory that has all of the letters of the alphabet, and then I'll put the project name into the letter that it works for, and I will use that as my remote repository. Once you've decided on the actual location of your repository, we can begin thinking about how we are going to use it in a way that best makes sense for our project. So the first thing I'm going to recommend, kind of generically for any project, is that you don't merge features directly into the master branch. You will want to put the master branch aside and have a working branch. That's one that you can experiment on and put these new features into without actually corrupting the master branch. Only once that working branch has reached a stable point will you merge it into the master branch. Now let's talk about some naming conventions that you can use within your branches. So of course we still have our main and working branches, but we also have these feature branches. 
and I will actually name these based on the feature that they are trying to implement, which is a pretty obvious way to do things. But I also want to put in some version numbers into these. And to do this, I like to do a parent-child relationship between the branches. So when I first create the repository, I'll probably immediately create the master branch and the working branch. And the master branch, when it's first created with no code in it, will be version zero. And so the working branch will be 0.0. .0. And then once I merge some features into the main branch, I will name that one. And the working branch will be 1.0. And these names are being applied to the individual commits within any branch. And a commit is basically a timestamp in the code. So you can say, remember the code at this particular point in time. So if I put a commit in the middle of this feature, then I will give that the name 0.0.1. .0 so that is the first commit on the branch of whatever feature I'm using with the parent 0.0. .0. Once I merge that into the working branch, I'll need to do another commit in the working branch, and I will call that 0.1 to reflect a commit happening in the working branch. And so any subsequent commits to the feature branch will be 0.1.1 or 0.1.2. And then once I merge those features into the working branch, then I'll call that 0.2. And of course, if we extend this out so that I have a commit happening after version 0.2, then it will be 0.2.0. .0. And I'm putting these names in the actual message that I put along with the commit. So the commit statement in any branch is going to be get commit dash m. And after the dash m, you can put a little message. And I will simply precede that message with these version numbers. That way, when I use the command git log, then it will show me all of the different commits and I'll have all of these clean version numbers to tell me what's happening where. That way I can very easily go back in my code and find what I'm looking for. So hopefully this video helped you see one way that you could organize a git repository that will make it easy for you to go back later and find different points of the code, and also for other people who are working on it to follow your train of work. Of course, there are many ways to do this, and if you have a different way of doing it, I would love to hear about it in the comments. So with that, if this video was helpful to you, please leave a like. It helps other people find the video and it helps me grow the channel. And if you would like to see more of this kind of content, you can subscribe to the channel. This is all part of a project where I am trying to build a company starting with those three laptops over there. So if you'd like to see more of that, feel free to check out some of the playlists and subscribe to the channel. And with that, thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.